Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for bringing us here to Delhi. We thank you for gathering us here today, Lord. We, we thank you, Lord, for our time of worship together, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that the praise and the worship that lifts up from this place has been an acceptable sacrifice unto you. And we now continue in our worship as we study your word and hear from what you've got for us today. Lord, I pray, Father, that those words which you've given to me, Lord, would be directly from the throne room and anything else would fall straight to the ground, Lord. I pray that it would uh, come straight from your throne room directly into people's hearts, Lord. Change someone's life here we pray Lord this morning transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit let us not leave today without getting a fresh touch from heaven we pray in Jesus mighty name Amen, Amen. turn with me if you will to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 to 6 I was setting the scriptures up on the on the system to show on the screen earlier and I, I couldn't work out why does the scripture look so different to what I was thinking. I put one Corinthians in uh, rather than two Corinthians. But it is two Corinthians chapter 10 uh, that we're going to read from here from the outset this morning. Um, and we're going to read the first few verses here and it says here from verse 1, I, Paul, myself, entreat to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Amen. The title of today's message, folks, is Fight or Flight, Confrontation or Capitulation. That is the choice uh, that faces us. And you may sit there and you may think, well, that seems a bit stark. Well, yes, it is stark. And that's the reality uh, of the situation that we're in. And I sense today that God wants to give us a rallying call, a rallying call. He's looking for who will stand for truth in this hour, in this age that we live in today. Arthur spoke just a couple of weeks ago on standing in the gap for the nation. Who has here and heard that message or who has heard it subsequently? That's a powerful message. If you haven't heard it yet, please do go and visit our YouTube channel. It's there, available. God is looking. We looked at a scripture there and it says, I looked for someone to stand and I found no one. And how sad that was. You know, when, when Arthur read that scripture, I just sat there and it hit me and I thought, wow. I said, what if God is looking today for someone to stand and contend for the nation and for the people around us and, and God finds nobody? What, what does that mean? And I want to tell you from the outset this morning, folks, God is not finished with this nation. Jesus is as much alive today as he always ever has been. Do you know, uh, back, I think it was in the 70s, when there was the Jesus movement uh, that started over in the U.S. and then spread around various countries, Time magazine had a front page that said, God's dead or God's no longer with us or, you know, think we've moved on, we've progressed from God. And then the Jesus movement kicked off, the Holy Spirit came crashing in and so many people were being saved and set free and being baptized and there was so much evidence of transformation going on. What did we find? just a couple of years later Time magazine God's not dead Amen. you see even the secular media had to accept that God's not dead because when the power of God comes crashing in it's undeniable and we are living in a time of darkness but folks take heart because the darkest part of the night comes just before the dawn and I don't see it quite so much now because it's got Later and later, but uh, if you go around in June, I remember driving around just about sort of two o'clock, and really there's only about 10 minutes of darkness in high June in this part of the world. Uh, and, and you can sit there, and if you go up into the hills, you can just see the sun has just dipped below, and it's just dark. And for a moment, it seems very still and very dark. And it looks like that's it, that's the day over. And then all of a sudden, doot, 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 it just suddenly starts to emerge. And then over the course of the next half an hour, a new day dawns. And I think a new day is dawning. Psalm 30 and verse 5 says, Though weeping, the second half of it says, Though weeping may endure for the night, joy, yes, joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Joy. It's okay to have a bit of joy 
It's okay to be a little bit joyful. We're not meant to be glum. I was walking through work last night. I don't know what happened. I must have just been tired. One of the girls in the restaurant, she looked at me and she said, Stuart, it's okay to smile, you know. And I was sitting there thinking, gosh, do I look that glum? Uh, maybe we should be thinking a bit more about showing the joy uh, that's deep down. I felt like saying, no, I'm actually really happy. I'm really joyful. Um, it just doesn't maybe look it. Uh, but we, we who know the absolute truth have the antidote to those who have diluted truth down to my truth. You heard that phrase going around a bit, my truth. Where feelings and emotions rule over facts. Where what we think and how we feel in the moment is what the truth is. Well, no one's denying that that's how you feel, but it doesn't change an objective fact. If a chair is a chair, or shall we say, if a man is a man or a woman's a woman, it doesn't matter what you feel on a given day. There's a simple fact there, and we need to state these simple facts. Let's give a little context to the passage that we, that we broke into there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is the, a letter that Paul wrote, to the second letter to the church at Corinth, uh, which was a place um, towards the sort of part of the world where Greece is. Um, and this church had been infiltrated with false teachers. Uh, they had been claiming that Paul was not to be trusted. He, uh, why? Because well, basically, he threatened the religious order. And wherever and whenever you threaten the religious order, you will find that the religious order rises up against you and makes all sorts of accusations. Because the religious order is into human control. God is into freedom. And so when we come in with the power of the Holy Spirit and we say it was for freedom that Christ has set us free no longer to be captive and to the yoke of slavery, the religious order says, ah, yes, um, but, you know... <laughs> There's a way and a time and a place to do everything properly. What they're really saying there is we want to be able to control things and we want to be able to control people. It's wrong. It's not there in the Bible. It's man-made uh, control systems. And Paul had been falsely accused by these religious types of, of presenting and, and, and circulating false teaching. And Paul is, in this chapter, he's defending his ministry. In some Bibles, uh, versions, this is actually headed up, Paul defends his ministry. It's important to defend our ministry, especially when we come against attacks. Here he defends what he knows to be the truth, and he's urging the church at Corinth to stand for that truth. He shows here that ministry is primarily spiritual warfare for spiritual purposes. And in the first two verses, he's urging them to model the correct character, to contend for the gospel, to do the right thing, so that he has no need to come to them and speak boldly to them. He says, I beseech you. Beseech you means to really strongly urge and everywhere we look in society today, we see evil rising. You don't actually have to look far. You don't have to look far. I saw evil rising even just this morning on the way to church. And the worst of it is that it's not just that evil's rising. Evil is now being celebrated as good. Everything is being twisted. It's all being inverted. Isaiah uh, chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, woe unto they who take good for evil and evil for good, take bitter for sweet and, bit, and sweet for bitter and darkness for light and light for darkness. Basically, God is going to condemn those who invert the truth. Everywhere we look, we see unhappy, unfulfilled people. You know, you walk around the streets and you see some people where their heads are so far buried into their neck, you wonder sometimes whether there even is a neck there. It's almost as if the weight and the pressures of the world and the world around them has got so much that they're just trudging around in this hopeless kind of robotic mode. God did not design us to be hopeless robots. He designed us with a unique purpose in his image, which gives us incredible value. Why are they so unhappy? Why are they so unfulfilled? Well, because they have exchanged the truth for a lie, and we can read more about that in Romans 1. We won't dive too deep there just today, otherwise we'll be here until 4 o'clock. Plenty reasons for why people are being unhappy. Whether it's rising costs, you talk, you know, the cost of living crisis, they go on about in the media, don't they? And I think there's probably less of a cost of living crisis than the media makes out, but hey, it's a good story and some nice big headlines for them. There's rising debt as a result. There's crumbling healthcare services. Uh, the corruption is rife across society. Drug and alcohol addiction through the roof. Even just a couple of weeks ago, we saw that alcohol deaths in Scotland were at a 12-year high. Uh, the marriage cast aside is outdated. Family breaking down left right and center, indoctrination in education, a crisis of sexuality, gender confusion, crime out of control, and some crimes virtually decriminalized because the police don't even bother investigating them, abortion being used, frankly, let's say, as birth control, 
40% of abortions in this country every year are to women who have already had at least one previous abortion. That is clearly showing its birth control. And the world on the brink of potential war, Russia, Ukraine, Africa, Middle East, and the civil war potentially in the US, not least to say our own land. There's a lot of things brewing. There's a lot of darkness around. But what are we going to do? Are we going to bury our heads in our necks and chest and march around with our little blue carrier sacks and say, woe betide me? Or are we going to say, actually, I'm going to lift my eyes up for my redemption draws near. You know, we had a general election just a couple of months ago. Who remembers a general election? It seemed like a lifetime ago. Uh, and, and maybe you've been privileged enough to go on holiday in the meantime, uh, and, and that was probably good to escape the situation of this country, I suppose. And, and, you know, many were saying, oh, the old previous administration, they're caught in mired in controversy, corruption, and, and all of this situation, and, and dodgy contracts, and dodgy people, and lying politicians. Lying politicians, nothing new, folks. Yeah. And, and, and so what we need is we need a new government to come and sweep in and they're going to fix it all and it's all going to be wonderful and it's all going to be brilliant. Well, it's not so rosy now, is it, really? Just a few months later. Have you seen the headlines this week? I, I better be careful what I say because apparently there's super injunctions in place, but you can bet your bottom dollar next couple of weeks there's going to be some interesting stuff coming out about the Prime Minister. Turns out he's in a spot of bother himself because he's not been too truthful, it would seem, about what's going on and he's tried to, I would suspect, um, how should I say this, hide certain aspects of his life. We won't go any further. And it seems already the government seems rather rudderless. Their big ideas seem to be freeze the elderly to death, which his own party just voted against, raising taxes, allowing men to become women, making it easier to slaughter the unborn, banning prayer in certain places because apparently it's too dangerous to allow people even to silently pray in their head. And then when people are inevitably get so depressed and they've had enough, they just want to let people kill themselves. And that's the reality of the plans that this government has got in place. So far from bringing change, they sort of talk of they had a whole conference, so change begins. It's just continuity, folks. It's the same thing. It's, it's continuity and continued decline. Why? Because we are a nation that has rejected God. We're a nation that has been, therefore, given over to itself. And as a result, we're a nation under judgment. I don't think it's worthwhile trying to pretend otherwise, but it's also not worthwhile getting caught up in all of that because there's a better story, there's a bigger picture, thanks be to God. And the question I want to ask you this morning is, what are we, what are you, what am I going to do about all of this? And you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know, I can't be part of the government, I can't make a big change. Well, we have a choice in every challenging situation. We face a challenging situation in our nation just now. We have a decision to make, whether we fight or whether we flight. Whether we run towards the fight and take up the arms and tackle the evil that's rising or whether we just run away from it, bury our head in our sand. Whether we essentially confront the evil or whether we uh, collude with it, either actively or subconsciously. Whether we focus on the victory in Jesus or accept defeat without even a single shot being fired. Confront or capitulate. Folks, that is the choice set before us today. We're at a stage in this nation where we must all, each of us, individually choose. We must contend for our families, friends, community, our society, our wider nation. And sometimes it might seem like giving up the easy option. And yeah, you know, I've been at various points in my life in various aspects where I think, yeah, I'll just give up. Ah, oh, what's worth it? Oh, it's too much hassle. I don't want to cause controversy. I'll avoid that conversation because it might be a bit tricky. Mm, yeah, I don't know how they're going to react. Well, folks, if you know it's the right thing to do, then you've got to go for it, however hard it might be. In the longer run, the better thing to do is to fight and engage in this spiritual battle because the stakes are too high not to. And many problems stem in our nation, stem from the state of the church, actually just as it was in the days of Corinth there. I want to look today uh, briefly at three groups in the church today. I want to look at the fighters, I want to look at the flighters, and I want to look at the fencers. Now we're not talking about the sport there, okay? Much of the New Testament is quite militaristic in style. If you read it, and you read it not just for the words that's on the page, but you read it in which the context is written, we see battle being waged. We see war being taken up. We see spiritual arms being taken up against the places of spiritual warfare, which are in those high places. And folks, this is a war that started in heaven. Yes, it started in heaven, and God started it. Why? Because the devil tried to stand in God's place. He tried to usurp God's power. And God could not have that. Why? Because heaven is a place of perfection. Heaven is a place where sin cannot be. 
rebellion, which is what sin is, cannot be there. So when the devil rebelled against God, God had to cast him out. And he cast him out. He took a third of the angels. Malcolm McPherson was here not so long ago, and he preached, and he said, actually, we can focus on how many demons there are, and people start seeing demons around every corner. And sure, there are a lot of demons. But if only a third of the angels went with the devil to hell, that means that the demons are outnumbered by a ratio of two to one because there's still two-thirds of the angels in heaven. Let's start focusing on the fact that the demons are outnumbered. Let's stop giving the devil too much time and get, let's stop giving him the upper hand in our life and start saying, actually, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's decide to confront and push back against the evil wherever it's found. Ephesians 6 has got a lot to say about spiritual warfare. We need to be equipped for the battle. We can't just wander into the battlefield and, and think that we're going to win without being equipped for it. We've got to prepare. We've got to equip. And then we've got to actually get onto the battlefield to fight the war. But of course, God does a lot of that battle for us. You want to take a deeper dive into that. I did a series probably nearly a year ago now, a three-part series on spiritual warfare. It's there on the YouTube channel. You can dial into it at your leisure. And the passage here today makes clear that it's a spiritual war. When we look at verse 3 here, when it, the language here is very militaristic, but it says, well, we walk in the flesh. We're not waging war according to the flesh. So he says we're not waging war according to the flesh, but the, the implication there is that we are waging war. So war is in flesh, but it's not according to the flesh. It means it's in the spiritual realm. It's not an outward force. We're dealing primarily here with dark forces, with demonic forces. We're, the, the doctrines of the gospel, the disciplines of the church, are the weapons that we wage. Why? Because the doctrines of the gospel here is the truth. And the truth is the best antidote to the lies that the devil puts out. Verse 4 says that spiritual weapons that we have have the power to destroy strongholds. Not just push them aside so that we can carry on our lives for that day and then carry on exactly the same problems the next day. No, to destroy. Destroy means to totally eradicate to the point where it's gone. Right? The leader of Hezbollah, destroyed. He is no more. He's met his maker. Probably got a little bit of a surprise. Did you know that God has given you power through the Holy Spirit to wage war on evil? Did you know that? You're not insignificant. You have a significant role to play in advancing, which means moving forward, the kingdom of God and pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Our weapons, folks, of warfare are powerful and mighty. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the part of the Trinity who is part of God and he comes to live in us. And a part of God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-seeing and all-doing is living within us. Then what does that do for us as mere mortal human beings? It totally transforms, turns the whole situation upside down. So how do we fight? Well, we can't fight spiritual war with our hands and our feet. Jehoshaphat he lined up his army, but he did not need to shoot a single arrow. Why? Because the prophet had said, line up and stand, but you won't need to fight yourself with your hands and with your own armaments because the battle belongs to the Lord. We were just singing that song this morning. Mary texted me the list of songs last night, and I promise you, she chose the songs. We did not collude. God spoke to me about what to say here this morning. She texted me last night with a song list just to kind of let me know where the worship team was going this morning, and I looked at it, and I thought, wow, we're still singing about the battle belongs. We're singing about the promises of God. We're singing that wonderful song there that he'll never fail us, that he'll never let us down, that he'll never leave us, that he'll never forsake us. God knows what he's doing, folks. Never doubt him. But we must ensure that we are solely directed by the Holy Spirit. Because when we allow ourselves to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit is doing, it creates problems. Why? Because it's become about us and not about God. And when it becomes about us, then we're serving us and our purposes rather than God's purposes. In verse 5 here talks about destroying the arguments. Every lofty opinion that is raised against the truth and God. We need to contend for the truth every single day. You know, I, I'm, I'm really rather tired of having to form opinions on matters that I never thought I would really never need to form an opinion on. Why should I need an opinion on whether a man can become a woman? Quite clearly it cannot. But no, we need to form an opinion and start having arguments and spending time and debating all of these things and watching all this content. And you sit and think, my goodness, it's tiring. It's tiring. And then you wake up the next day and you think, oh, whatever next. Well, you better get your opinion right now on, on um, 
sexualization of children, because I tell you now, that's where they're heading. It's very dark, very dark indeed. If we don't start to contend for the truth on that matter, then oof, where are we going to go? When we see or hear lies, they must be tackled. It says, it says here that, that, that though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. Okay, right? But then when we go forward, we destroy arguments. So how are we destroying those arguments? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the words to speak. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says, don't worry about you, what you'll say in that day, for it will be the Holy Spirit speaking through you. I used to do debating when I was at university, and, and, and the rules of, of structured debating is that anything that's said that is unchallenged stands. So you could say some of the most outrageous, ridiculous, pompous things, and if it wasn't challenged by the other side, then it counted as a point in favor of you, even though it could be demonstrably quite easily proven as false. Okay? Uh, it, it's quite, quite an easy little tactic to do, and it's, it's a test of whether the other side is actually listening and following, following the debate. And folks, if we don't contest obvious falsehoods that are said or heard all around us, people will not know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, is what the word says. So if they don't know the truth, how can they be set free? Matthew Henry, in his wonderful commentary on the Bible, which I use a lot, he says, truth is an incredibly powerful weapon. He says, the evidence of truth is convincing and cogent. I love that phraseology. It's convincing, and it's cogent. So why do we need to fight? Well, God could have given up with you. He could have given up with me a long time ago. But for whatever reason, he chose not to. I think that reason is because he loves us with an everlasting love. God could have given up on Israel a long time ago, but his love endures forever. His covenant with Israel, his promises stand forever. He is faithful. And there's a physical aspect to, uh, the, uh, um, to the, the spiritual war, and we're seeing that being played out in the Middle East right before our very eyes this week. Just when everyone kind of thought, oh, well, where are we going next? All of a sudden, the Hezbollah pages start spontaneously, as it were, exploding, and then the walkie-talkies, and then the entire leadership's taken out in the space of 48 hours. Folks, that's divine intervention. Divine intervention that... Netanyahu was not even planning to go to the UN, so he apparently went to the UN as a whole distraction to make the Hezbollah leadership relax, to think that, oh, well, the focus is going to be on the UN. Meanwhile, he set up a little HQ in the hotel room, coordinated the attack, set their planes to go, and boom, that was it. Kaboom. They met their maker. God is faithful forever. His promises stand forever. And verse 5 again here seems to suggest that the devil puts things in people's way that causes them not to come to a knowledge of God. Because if we look at it in the other way, it says we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God. What are these lofty opinions that are raised against the, the knowledge of God? These are the lies, the deceptions that the devil puts into people's minds that causes them to believe a lie and causes them to not believe the truth. So that's why we have to destroy those arguments. That's why, as tiring as it may be to, to keep forming opinions on all these things that we never thought we would need to form opinions, we have to. We need to form opinions that come out of the Word of God and stand for the truth because then when we hold the truth up, as Matthew Henry says, it's convincing and it's cogent and it will transform someone. Amen. When they're confronted with the truth, they'll say, I never knew that. I never knew that. I was speaking to someone even just this last week uh, and, and you know, the, the, the name Trump was mentioned, and you just, people, it's like a mama, isn't it? Some people have the reaction, some people have that reaction. Um, and this person had one particular reaction. They said, oh, that's, you know, I remember at school we were shown a video and, and, and they said that he told people during COVID to drink bleach. Um, no, he didn't. So I said, actually, um, do you remember how long that clip was? It was about 20 seconds. I said, right, so you probably didn't see the previous 15 minutes when the scientific advisor of the US was in that briefing room explaining that different chemicals could potentially have a, a, an impact on COVID and start to reverse the effects of it, et cetera, et cetera. And one of those was some of the chemicals that were in bleach that might start to help us. So Trump was merely making a comment, and he literally made a comment looking at the advisor and saying, ah, oh, it's interesting. I didn't know that. Maybe we should investigate that a bit further. Maybe, maybe there's something in that. So somehow a 20-second clip then gets taken from that and circulated everywhere. Oh, Trump's promoting bleach drinking. Do you see, but then what happened is even over in this country, teachers are then showing that content of the 20-second clip to children who are now adults 
who are now at the point where they start to have relationships and in a few years start to have children, and they're going to bring their children up to think that this man told people to drink bleach. Nothing of the sort ever happened. We have to confront the lies. We have to confront the deceptions that come in, and we have to point them people to the truth. Otherwise, they will not know. God has placed you in family. He's placed you in friendships. He's placed you in jobs to contend for the truth, not to be neutral or just to fall in line. We're, just not, we're not just another blob in society. We are ambassadors for Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 shows us that. It says we are ambassadors for Jesus. We carry his message everywhere. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is someone that represents. You know, the, the, the UK ambassador to the US is not a US citizen. He doesn't stand for the US, he stands for the UK. He goes over to the US and he represents the UK's interests. We are ambassadors for Christ. It means we represent Christ's interests. We represent the kingdom of God wherever he takes us. Making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. To be a Christian, folks, is to be a fighter for truth. But some people are not fighters, are they? Secondly, they are flighters. They run away from the fight. They're, they're perhaps uh, they're, they're scared of confrontation, and sometimes understandably so. It's not always the easiest thing to do. But that's when we allow it to become about us, and we allow our own flesh to get ahead and say, Oof, I'm not sure if I can do that. But you know, when I have situations, whether it's in the church or in work or elsewhere in life where confrontation is needed, do you know, a simple couple of seconds prayer, speak for me here, Holy Spirit, lead me here. Oh, it makes such a difference compared to the situations where I run in with my little sort of, I'm going to say the truth here. And you feel, oh my gosh, that really kind of exploded. And I end up having to sort of back out and regroup before I can move forward again. Compared to the times where I've actually asked the Holy Spirit up front to help me. And you see, you come away from a situation and you think, oh, well, that seems to have resolved itself. Flighters often join the crowd. You know that, that phrase, can't beat them, then join them. Yes. You know that, that, that sort of nonsense idea, ah, well, we'll just give up the fight. It's not worth it, so we'll just go and join them anyway. It's not, not the right, it's not the right attitude to be taking. People fall into compromise. They think it's easier to fit in with the world rather than stand out. I know a load of people that don't want to rock the boat. Oh, it's easier if we just say this. And folks, so much of the church today sadly looks more like the world than some of the world itself. But the problem is we're meant to be distinctive from the world. Romans 12 and 2, it says, Do not therefore be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah? That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to be distinctive from the world. God has called us out from the things of the world. And in verse 1 and 2, back in 2 Corinthians 10 here, we see that Paul is pleading with the church at Corinth to stand for the truth. Don't be persuaded by these false teachers that have crept in. Don't allow yourselves to listen to them. They might have a little smooth argument here and there, but don't allow yourself to be convinced by it. And the message for us here today is urging us also to stand for the truth. Yes, this letter's written to a particular people at a particular time, but it's here in the Bible for us today. So we need to look and we need to explore and we need to say, yes, understand the context, but what does God say through that context to us in our lives for today? Flighters choose that instead of rising to the challenge to confront evil, they decided to capitulate to it. Sometimes not definitively. They didn't wake up one day and say, today I will capitulate. I've never met someone that decided to capitulate. But it happens over time, bit by bit. They lose their fire. They lose their zeal. And then you see someone once every three weeks, once every four weeks in the church, and suddenly you don't see them for several months, and then you bump into them in the street, and, and they, you kind of, they, they don't want to see you because you're confronted with the truth. Many people who have capitulated, as 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5 says, they have the appearance, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power therein. The Bible tells us clearly to avoid such people. It couldn't be clearer. What about false preachers, false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, as Matthew 7 and 15 puts it? Many of those kicking around sadly these days. 
And when we look at the church, there's so many churches that do such wonderful things, and, and you wouldn't want to criticize the wonderful things, but what is its purpose? What is it serving, or who is it serving? And you might think, wow, you know, the food bank, it's going to feed someone today, and it's going to be terrific, and it, look at this, it's wonderful, and there's a real buzz about the building, and it's, it's so great and excellent. Yeah, of course. But it will leave them spiritually hungry and ultimately dead unless that food bank is accompanied by the full gospel of Jesus. Yes. My sister's church has a wonderful ministry called a Compassion Ministry, and part of what they do there is a food bank. And one of the things that they do, they don't know who's coming in from week to week, but what they do is they, well, as the team is putting all the packages together, they pray over the packages, and quite often people have got prophetic words or scriptures, and they just write them on a little card and they put them in the box. And again, they have no idea. It's not like the box has a name on it. They have no idea who's coming in. So first come, first serve. The boxes get picked up by whoever comes in the door first. They have a little chat. They see how they're getting on. If it's a repeat person, they offer to pray. They offer to see what support they can offer them. Where are they at in life? What can they do? Are they in church? Are they out of church? Because that's what it's all about. They teach. They show them the gospel. There's always a tract or a gospel leaflet in the box as well. Do you know the amount of people that have come back a week or several weeks afterwards and saying, how did you know? Because they lifted up their box and they took out the, the food parcels and then there was this card and it had a scripture that spoke straight to them. Or it was a prophetic word about a specific situation going on in their life. How did they know they did not but the Holy Spirit did? Amen. Or a prison ministry. It might get someone through a sentence but it will leave them condemned to hell unless the focus is on transformation through repentance. Or what about a fair trade cafe? I was walking through Edinburgh the other day and there's, there's a church, I won't name the specific church, but it has, a, it has a one world cafe, fair trade products, and it's all wonderful and bright colors, six colored rainbow, if you know where I'm heading on that. It's lovely, it's very pretty. But that won't save a single soul unless it's accompanied by the gospel. Or even a church hall that opens itself up for community events and opens itself up for anything else that may come along will be nothing more than just a nice soft community space unless every opportunity is used for advancing the gospel. You know when we have the, the slimming world people coming in here, we talk to them, we ask them, so how's it going? We become aware of situations in people's lives, we offer to pray for them. This is not just some kind of vacuous space for the local community to just come and use to bring in all their lardy darnas. This is the house of God. And it's the house of God seven days a week, regardless of whether we're actually having a church service or whether there's something else going on. It's still the house of the Lord. Everything, folks, the church does must always center around Jesus because anything else is a departure from its purpose. But others, they haven't decided to capitulate. They just don't see the point of fighting. If we don't think there's something worth fighting for, then we won't turn up to the fight. I support a couple of football teams who are very mediocre at the moment, uh, uh, to say the least. And, um, you know, I just don't think it's worth following them much. What's it worth? What's the point? I don't want to waste my time on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon or whenever following it and getting all the... You can become obsessed by these things. But what's the worth? It's just going to make me feel depressed. Oh, they missed another pass and they scored another own goal. Terrific. Isn't that wonderful? But if we don't know what it is that we're fighting for, or we don't think that it's worth fighting for, the thing that we do know, then we won't turn up. We need to know the spiritual significance of what's happening around us. So you might look and you might see the headlines on the news and you might think, well, the government said this today. Uh-huh. What's the Spirit of God saying? What's the other darker realms happening here? Because as Ephesians 6 says, we are waging war against spirituality and principalities in the high places. It's not just the face on the TV you need to be concerned about. It's the spirit behind the face. It starts with recognizing that we are predominantly spiritual beings. John 4 and 2 says that God is spirit. And then when we look at 1 Genesis 26, it says that clearly we are created in God's image. So if God is spirit and we're created in God's image, then we are therefore primarily spiritual beings. But some are too scared of the consequences of fighting. Think about young Jonah there, sent with a mission to go to Nineveh to tell them this message that God needed to get to them. He tried to avoid it. He was so scared of, of giving the message. He tried to do everything he possibly could to avoid it. God sent a whale to deliver him. He got himself on a boat. They got thrown overboard. He thought he was going to die. God sent a whale, swallowed him up, and delivered him to Nineveh anyway, and they got the message there. 
God gives you a purpose, don't try and run away from it. Instead, just choose to say, okay, God, however hard this is, however difficult this might be, I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to go for it full furlong because you're going to be with me because you promises are yes and amen, and you promise to never leave and never forsake me. Moses, he tried to avoid going, the calling of going and speaking to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, because he says, I, I don't have that voice. I've been in the wilderness for all these years. I don't have that ability. God raises up Aaron to stand by him to speak for him. They went together. What about Peter? He denied Jesus three times because he thought that would make life easier. Whilst Jesus was inside, there he was warming his hands by the fire. Someone recognized him. He says, no, nah, I wasn't with there. It wasn't me. He tried to take what he thought in that moment was the easy option, but it ended up with condemnation and he ended up in a tremendous place of repentance. Evil creeps in, folks, when we go to sleep, when we stop contending for the truth. Jude uh, urges us to contend for the faith and contend for truth. Um, let's turn to Jude there. Um, very easy to find. Go to the back of the Bible. It's the page before the start of Revelation. It's a very, very short letter, literally only one chapter. And Jude verses 3 and 4 says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend, there's that word, for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Uh -huh. They've crept in unnoticed. Who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I saw a video on social media this week of a so-called pastor or a pastorette uh, in somewhere, I don't even know where it is, uh, who was saying that actually uh, she thinks that if Jesus was alive today, he would escort women to have an abortion. And she stood there at the pulpit and said she was proud of not having one but two abortions. And I just sit there and my heart broke. I just feel like, what, uh, what situation do you get in where you can even be in that position? But worse still, woe betide the church that has allowed that to come in and call itself a leader in the church. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, who pervert the grace of our God. They take the truth and they exchange it for a lie. Running from the fight will not bring the revival and the ultimate reformation that this nation, our society, those around us so desperately need, nor will it come automatically. Verse 5, back in 2 Corinthians 10 there, shows that we need to take action. It says we destroy arguments. It doesn't say the arguments are destroyed. Do you see the subtlety of the language there? We destroy the arguments. The arguments don't just fall flat themselves. Just as in a debate, anything that is said stands unless it's contested. We take all thoughts captive. When the devil comes a-lying to you, when the devil comes attempting you, we take that thought captive and we say, nope, I'm standing on the truth. I know the truth. I'm going to look at this word of God here and proclaim it. I'm going to throw it in the face of the devil and say, take that and get out of here. There's no space for flighters, folks, in the kingdom of God, even though sometimes that can appear to be the easier option. We need to recognize the active role, yes, it's an active role, that we are all called to in this spiritual warfare. The only option is to be a fighter. But there's also a third group to look at here, and it's the fencers. As I said before, I'm not talking about that funny sport, sword fighting. Those who are sitting on the fence, they don't take a side. They think they're being the nice ones. Oh, we're not going to go to the left or to the right. We'll just sit in the happy middle ground. There's no neutral territory, folks. There's no such thing as neutral territory. There's simply good and evil. There's no middle ground. If you're not fighting for God, you're colluding with the devil. And you might say, something, gosh, Stuart, that's a really strong thing to say. It is, and I remember writing that bullet point on the note, and I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, that's a really strong point. And it is a strong point. But it's the truth. Why? Because when we turn to Matthew 12 and 30, and I'm going to, uh, we put the scripture up in um, the English Standard Version, but I'm going to read it from the Message Version because I think it just puts it so aptly. 
I'm not going soft. I haven't started reading the message version before you start worrying. But it says here, this is war, and there is no neutral ground. If you are not on my side, you're the enemy. If you're not helping, you're making things worse. Ah. Well, what does that mean? I mean, it's pretty clear. There is no neutral ground. There is good and there is evil. We choose this day who we'll serve. Arthur went around the whole nation, eight cities tour last year, proclaiming that message. Choose you this day who you will serve. You're either for God or you're against him. You cannot be partly for him. Because wherever we give ground, Satan takes up ground. Wherever we are not advancing the gospel, the devil will himself advance. Our voluntary evacuation from the public square as the church has created a void, and into that vacuum the devil has leapt, and he's filled it with all of these other things. You want to know where all of this filth and nonsense and perversion rose from in our society that we see today? That we see all these young children walking around half-dressed when they're mid-teenagers and they haven't been brought up properly? This didn't happen automatically. This happened because the church evacuated itself and stopped proclaiming the truth in the public square. Yeah. We secluded ourselves into our own little buildings and then they tried to shut their own little buildings down and that was it. You see, the devil is constantly pushing back. So we need to be constantly pushing back on the devil because if we're not pushing back on the devil, the devil is pushing us backwards. Bonhoeffer, that German pastor during World War II, said silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Folks, silence is complicity. The fences, they try to appease rather than confront. You cannot appease the devil. In Revelation 3, we find uh, the, the, the letter to the Laodicean church there. He says, I know that you are neither hot nor cold. You're just lukewarm, and because of that, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. There's clear warnings there. We cannot afford to be lukewarm. We need to be on fire for God. Jesus wants to know, are we for him or are we against him? Mm, uh, well, it depends on the weather. Mm, uh, well, I didn't sleep so well last night, so I'll maybe just not go to the church this morning. You know, for, I, 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 I don't know about anyone else. I don't really care how you look when you come into this place. I just care that you're here. You come here in your pajamas if you want. Didn't have time to get washed, didn't have time to get dressed. You know, we'll we work on that step by step. But you come just as you are. That's what we say. Come just as you are, but leave transformed. And if you come in your pajamas, we might even find you some clothes to go home in. Who knows? If you're not pushing forward in your life spiritually, then you're backsliding. If you're standing still, then you're backsliding because the devil will be pushing against you. Why? Well, we know that from 1 Peter 5 and 8. It says that the devil is prowling around like a lion looking for his next victim to devour. Christ told us to occupy until I come. Occupy until I come, Luke 19. But we've capitulated, we've surrendered, we've withdrawn, we've sat back and we've abandoned the Great Commission. And the world will see our silence as agreement, as tacit agreement, regardless of what we actually think. Take homosexuality. A number of years ago when gay, quote-unquote, marriage was going through the parliaments and whatever else, where was the church in all of that? Almost totally silent. Yet if you ask most church leaders, oh no, we don't agree with that. So where were you? When the churches were shut down in this country, how many churches are there even in just this local area? And yet, in the entirety of Scotland, just 27 stood and said, no, we're going to challenge the government. Praise God, we won. Arthur was one of them. The silent fence-sitters are the main reason why the nation is in the state it is today. It's not people that have capitulated fully and, and compromised. They are a problem, but it's the fence-sitters that just sit there silently and refuse to stand and contend for the truth. They prioritize being at peace, as it were, with the world rather than obedience to what God's calling is for their lives. So as I said from the outset here, we all have a choice to make, each of us individually. Do we fight or do we flight? We need to decide to confront evil or capitulate to it. The decision is for each of us individually to make. It's not for the person next to you. It's not for the person in front of you, behind you. It's for each of us individually to make that decision. We need to decide which side we're on. Choose who we will serve. Giving in might be an easy option, but it's also the coward's option. The brave thing, the bold thing to do is to stand and to fight. Evil is rising all around us. And I want to ask, what 
are you going to do about it? Or more importantly, what can you do about it? And you might say, well, I can't do that. Okay, so start focusing on the cans. Focus on those things that you can affect change in. I can speak to my neighbor and confront the lies of the media that they've swallowed. I can't change the output of the BBC. But I can talk to my neighbor and help them to start discerning what they actually read and see. It starts with us getting right with God. Arthur spoke last week and he has already announced that today we have this 10 days, 10 days of awe, as it's so-called in the, in the Jewish calendar coming up. We're going to use this time to get close to God. We're going to use this time to refine that fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're going to re find that time to reconnect with that intimacy that Jesus so determines and so desires for us. He has called us on to the battlefield to contend for the truth. This nation is worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for, folks. I know that, and I know that God's not done with this nation because otherwise he would have destroyed this nation long ago. We have been continuing in wickedness in this nation for so many years that if God was finished and he didn't have future plans for this nation, he would have long since given up on us. But he has not, because he's got future plans, he's got future purposes for this nation. It's a sorry situation that when we used to be the nation that sent missionaries to Africa, that now African missionaries have to come here in order to re-evangelize us because we have abandoned the truth. And Africa's sitting there saying, look at this godless place called the United Kingdom. And yet, it was the United Kingdom that sent people to evangelize Africa in the first place. What a terrible situation. What a sorry situation. And so we are in a bad state, but God in his mercy, I believe, has heard the cries of his people, and he's not finished. The nation is in a poor state because the church has sat back, and it's been silent and even capitulated, compromised. We've run from the fight, but folks, it's time to get back in the fight. All is not lost. We can be a great nation again, but we can only be a great nation again if we first become a good nation. And we can only become a good nation when we put God, when we put Jesus front and center of everything that we do as a society. Your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, they're all worth people, they're all people that are worth fighting for. They're worth contending for. They're worth spending time in prayer for. You know, Jesus literally got onto the field of war when he stepped out of the tranquility and the peace and the perfection of the place of heaven and he came to live amongst us. He did not need to do that. He could have chosen not to do that. He decided we were worth fighting for. He decided you were worth fighting for and he contended and he still contends for each of every one of us today. He went through all the pain, all the suffering and all of the rejection at any one point, he could have backed out and no one would have criticized him. He could have backed out and he couldn't, could have decided he wasn't going to go through with it, but he chose to continue and he chose to go through with it. Why? Because he hung there on the cross in the most public spectacle that there ever has been in contending for the truth and standing against evil and he cried out with his last breath, it is finished. So perhaps today you're sitting there and you're thinking, well... Yeah, I once had that fight and I, I've just lost it a little bit. I've become a little bit lukewarm. I've not been quite as close to Jesus. You know, the last few weeks, I've actually not been nearly on as fire for God. And I, I started the beginning of this week and I said, I need to get that fire back. I need to get that fire back. And even just driving around, you know, there's sometimes even just this morning, I was so overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, I nearly had to pull over. I don't actually know how I got here safely. Uh, and just that realization and coming again to a fresh place of the understanding of what it is that Jesus has done for us. Things will continue to get darker, but it will also continue to get lighter. As darkness rises, so too must the church. Why? Because people need a clear choice. So that when Jesus returns, no one will be able to stand there and say, Ah, oh, but I didn't know. Ah, oh, but I wasn't given a choice. There'll be no excuse. You will live victoriously in Jesus and you will live in the promises of God, not the lies of the devil. Folks, it's time to get the fight back. It's time to step up to the calling of God. It's time to get in the ring. If everyone says it's for others, then no one will stand inevitably. It's a fight for us all, not just someone else. And God is looking today for who will stand in the gap. What are you choosing, fight or flight? Maybe you even have been sitting on the fence and you need to get off it. 
The sons of Issachar, they were discerning the times, and as a consequence, they knew what to do. Many in the church today have gone so far asleep that they aren't even aware of what's happening. And because they're not aware, they're not discerning. And so because they're not discerning, they're not awake to the spiritual significance of what's going on. And because they're not awake to the spiritual significance, they're not concerned about things. And because they're not concerned, they're not praying. Prayer changes things. And when we work all of that backwards, if you're going to pray, you're going to pray about the things that you're concerned for. You're going to get concerned about the things that you are spiritually awake to the significance of. And you're going to be awake to the things that you become aware of. Folks, it starts with getting right with God and it starts right here today. So let's determine to get right with God. Seek that fire of the Holy Spirit back in your heart. Stir yourself up in the Holy Spirit. Folks, let's spend these 10 days really getting close to God. Let's spend these 10 days really getting serious for Jesus once again. Determine, folks, to be a fighter, not a flighter, not a fencer. Determine to contend for Jesus wherever God leads you. Determine not to back down, not to compromise, not to capitulate. God promises to never leave us. He will strengthen us. And we will be able to stand. And as Ephesians 6 says, and having done all, to stand. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning here. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you would help us to get back to that place of intimacy with you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause us to stand for truth in this hour, in this day. We pray, Lord, that you would cause us to contend for the truth through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I want to pray for anyone here today that's feeling a bit lukewarm, that's feeling like they have, their love for you has grown a bit cold. They've lost their first love. Lord, I want to pray, Father, that they would get that back here today. And I pray here for anyone that doesn't yet know you this morning. Lord, I thank you that you contended for us when you hung on that cross. And you died for us. You went through with it all. And you did it all because you love us because you couldn't bear to see us in our condemnation of sin. And you provided a way, and you made it so easy and so simple, because you said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You didn't make a way, you made the way. You are the way. We thank you for that, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are alive today. We thank you that your Holy Spirit comes to live within us, to guide us, to lead us, to speak for us, to protect us. Oh God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your, the fire of your Holy Spirit would rise up in each of us in this hour, that we would contend for the truth wherever we go, whether it's with our friends, whether it's with our neighbors, whether it's with our family, our colleagues, wherever we go, whatever we do, may we stand for the truth, may we call out evil, and may we once again see this nation arise to be a good nation, a nation that puts you at the center of it, oh God. So, Lord God, we ask, Father, that you would take all these words, Lord, and help it to bury deep down within us, Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit and bless us all, Lord God, as we move from this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.